He said, God, my Savior, send all of us. Stop. Stop. Promises God, my Savior. Is that your favorite song from today? That's my second. That's, that's your the, second favorite song. No, that, that's the, that's the, oh, that the, oh, that's the other one. Oh, that's the other one. Okay. Bye. Right. Tell everybody bye. 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 Say have a good week. I, Let go of him. I, I think you have a good week. Good week. Have, have a great week. Good week. All right. Today we're talking about Barnabas, and it's a friend of many, and we will be in the book of Acts. We will be Acts 4, verses 32 through 37, Acts 9, 26 through 27, and Acts 11, 20 through, 22 through 24, and I did this one different. Um, I just did bullet points. Um, since we're talking about Barnabas, um, I just kind of highlighted um, the things we know about his life. So, it's going to, I guess, just call it like a quick overview, maybe. I mean, not go into much detail. Uh, I think we all know, or the reason I remember Barnabas is encouragement. That's what his name means. And everyone needs encouragement. And there's a poem by William Arthur Word that I want to read. And it's four lines, very simple, but it couldn't be any truer meaning. It says, flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not forget you. Those things are all true. Um, I'm the world's worst. It says, flatter me, and I may not believe you. Give me a compliment, and I don't know how to react. I don't. I stumble over my words. A simple thank you doesn't seem enough. I always feel like I should say something more. Um, I've gotten better about just saying thank you, but I don't take compliments well. So that part, you don't flatter me, and I'm not going to believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. How true is that? Um, I always loved in school constructive criticism. In my job, constructive criticism. To me, there is no such thing. Criticism is criticism. Yes, it's how it can be delivered that um, or how it comes across. I understand their point, but criticism, criticism is criticism to me. And I'm not going to like it. I know very few people that like, they like to be the criticizer, but they don't like to be the person being criticized. So that part's true. Then the next line, ignore me and I may not forgive you. Oh, this hits home. Uh, how many people can say they can remember everything somebody did good for them? And it might take them a little bit to do that, but buddy, you ask, oh, well, who's done you wrong? And it's like rapid fire them shooting off. Well, I did this for them and they didn't do it or I did this or can you believe that I sent them this package and they didn't even say thank you or I thought of them while I was on vacation and I brought back them a gift and they didn't care. They said they already had it. I mean, just think about it. If we ignore somebody, my biggest pet peeve and I probably shouldn't say it, but my biggest pet peeve is walking into the church building and somebody saying, well, she didn't speak to me today. She didn't even look at me today. But yet, they're the first ones out the door. They're 10 minutes late walking in the building. They're first one out the door before church is even over, right after communion. But yet, I'm the one that ignored them. Or I'm talking to somebody else and I didn't get a chance to um, speak to you. Oh, they, she ignored me today. She must be mad at me. She ignored me. I'm not going to go back. I got my feelings hurt. Or we had a meal and she didn't sit by me. She totally just ignored me. You all have been there. You know the examples I'm using. Do we forget it? We don't forget it. We don't forget it. It doesn't matter that 10 other people said something to us, that somebody else sat with us at the meal. You're concentrating on this one person and you're going to look at this one person and just concentrate on them. And if they don't do what you want them to do, they're ignoring you. Um, I hear this a lot, um, or I had this feeling. Actually, we went to a church one time and nobody spoke to us. Nobody said a word to us. We were visitors. I mean, yeah, we had the occasional hi. You know, as you're walking down the pew, they kind of waved. And, you know, Matt says, hey, how you doing? And they go on. Not one person came up and introduced themselves afterwards. Not one person came up when we walked in and said, hey, it's nice to have you here. Who are you? Where are you from? Are you traveling? Are you visiting? 
Are you doing whatever? Um, I've heard stories of a preacher going on a tryout. And the church that he was there for a tryout did this very same thing. They were not welcoming. They ignored you. We've been on the receiving end of that. It's not fun. I've really got to stop myself and make sure I'm not the one doing that to somebody. I try to make a conscious effort not to ignore people. Is it possible to get to every single person in the building every single Sunday? No, not at all. But can I make a conscious effort if I know somebody feels that they're being ignored? If I hear of that, to make a conscious effort to go to them first? Or maybe make sure I speak to them or send them a text or sit by them? So that line was true. I'm not going to forget if you ignore me. The last line is also true. Encourage me and I will not forget you. Same thing with when we think somebody did us did something good for us and list the bad. We will never forget people who encouraged us. We will never forget the people who are in our corner. The people who do things for us. And that is what Barnabas was. Barnabas was the encourager. Everybody loved him. He had that bubbly personality. He was just someone you wanted to be around. Um, some other things about Barnabas is we know he was a Jew. We know he was from the tribe of Levi and that he lived in Cyprus. Acts 4.36 tells us when the apostles changed his name to Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement, um, his name was originally was Joseph, or I don't know how to say it. I want to say like, I know I'm going to pronounce it wrong. It's J-O-S-E-S. -S. Um, I don't know how to pronounce that, but that was his original name. And the apostles um, in Acts verse 4, verses 36, and J-O-S-E-S, -S, who is also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated Sons of Encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and bought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Brought the money and laid at apostles' feet. So the first part of that, verse 36, the apostles changed his name to Son of Encouragement. From what they saw from his personality, he was Sons of Encouragement. Then verse 37, we see that he sold the field, gave the money to the apostles to help other Christians, to help people who needed it. So that falls into his reputation. He had a good reputation. He was popular. He was well, well respected. He was followed. He was a person you wanted to be around. He made you feel better. He built you up. He stood up for Saul and persuaded others to accept him. We see this in Acts 9, 26 and 27. Now this is important because this was before um, when Back when Saul had changed his life, you know, before he was known for persecuting Christians, he hated the Christians, he did all these th horrible things, now he's changed, and how hard is that? How many people can let go of your past? How many of them are going to forget what you've done? Probably anybody's going to forget your past, forget if you've wronged them. Saul has made this radical transition. He's now a Christian. So Barnabas goes with him and Barnabas persuades these people. Yes, he really is good. Yes, he did all those bad things. He, he is guilty of that, but he's changed. He's now a Christian. He's now someone that you all can trust, someone you can follow. So they sent Paul, uh, Barnabas. Why? Barnabas is an encourager. He knew his way with words. He knew how to get these people to trust Paul. He, um, another thing about Barnabas, he was not afraid to speak out. And not only does he speak out, he boldly proclaimed the truth. He, he didn't beat around the bush, but he said it in that nice, kind way. He didn't beat people over the head with it. He wasn't harsh with it. He just knew what to say, how to say it, and he wasn't afraid to say it. Acts eleven twenty three. 23 it tells us Barnabas went and encouraged the people to continue with the Lord after the stoning of Stephen. So I kind of feel like Barnabas was always sent um, to clean up the mess, so to speak. Um, he was sent with Saul to get people to listen to him, to follow him, to encourage people, to say, hey, you can trust him. Now he's here to clean up the mess after Stephen. Stephen was stoned to death. People are in uproar. So Barnabas is sent to tell these people, hey, it's okay. We're going to get back on track. Keep sticking with it. Keep staying with the Lord. Keep doing what you have to do to stay on the right track. Then we keep going. That same chapter, two verses down, 25 and 26. 
Barnabas and Saul get together. And they start going together. They start traveling together. They start teaching together. And they taught the Gentiles about Christ. Together they did. So he had a buddy. They went with each other. They got along great. Barnabas went, wanted to go to his hometown. He wanted to go back to Cyprus. Why? He wanted to save his people there. What, what do we do? What should we do? What are we commanded to do? If you are married, you need to make sure your spouse is getting to heaven with you. Then if you have children, that's your next priority. Make sure your children are going to get to heaven. Do all you can do to get to teach them the right ways. Then, I hate to put it this way, but worry about others. Worry about your neighbors. Worry about, you know, so what is what does Barnabas want to do? Barnabas wants to go back to his hometown where he knows his people are not saved. He wants them to become Christians, to do what is right. So he wants to go. He knows these people. He has a relationship with these people. Yes, he's an encourager. People love to be around him, but it's just something different about going home. It's just something different when you get your own family to believe. So Barnabas goes back home. Paul travels. But he came back. They're teaching with Paul. And guess what? Everything's hunky-dory until it wasn't. Until we had a disagreement. We're humans. We're going to have a disagreement. We're going to disagree. And they had a big disagreement. Acts 15, 37 through 41 talks about this disagreement. It says, Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. So they had a disagreement. Barnabas wants to take his cousin John Mark. John Mark had been with them before. He had deserted them. Paul did not trust him. Paul did not want to take him again. Well, again, Barnabas is kind of stuck in the middle. It's family. He wants to give John Mark another chance. He wants him to go along with them. He trusts him. Again, he's encouraging. Let's be an encouragement to this guy. Let's give him a second chance. And Paul says, nope. So they agreed to disagree and they went their separate ways. Then we don't hear anything else about Barnabas until Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. We, this is when Peter was associated with the Gentiles and then he was associating with the Jews. Um, he didn't differentiate. He mixed them together. And in verse 13 of Galatians chapter 2, Paul calls Barnabas and Peter hypocritical because he wasn't just the Gentiles. He wasn't just the Jews. He associated with both of them. And Paul said that was wrong, that you could not do it. And after that, we don't know what happened to Barnabas. We don't know if he continued preaching, if he continued traveling. We don't know. We don't know what he did. We don't know if he stayed in Cyprus. We don't know. So that is my bullet points for Barnabas. All pretty much positive things, but yes, he's human. Yes, there was a disagreement, but it didn't turn into a whole big blow up, knock down, drag out fight. They agreed to disagree. They went on. They went on. And at that point, Barnabas was still continuing to tell others about Christ. He was still leading others and encouraging others. So what are five things that we can learn from Barnabas? The first thing is a good reputation will aid your work for the Lord. People trusted Barnabas. Do people trust us? Barnabas was lucky. He was able to teach both Jews and Gentiles. He didn't have to just teach his kind. He was able to teach everyone because they knew him to be a man of integrity. Are we people of integrity? If our reputation is not respectable, we will have a difficult time teaching people about Jesus. Proverbs 22.1 says a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, losing favor rather than silver and gold. A good name. We want to have a good name. Number two, we should speak boldly for the Lord. Barnabas was bold. He spoke the truth. He had no trouble speaking the truth. We have God on our side. We shouldn't be afraid to tell people the truth. God has promised us a spirit of power and love and self-control. And that is 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us that. So we need to be bold. So we need to have a good reputation, have integrity, be an encourager. We need to speak boldly for the Lord. 
Third, don't let a disagreement with a fellow Christian keep you from working from the Lord. And this is a big one. Just because somebody ruffles your feathers, just because somebody looks at you wrong, just because somebody says a crossword, everybody has bad days. We're all human. Not one of us is going to think like the other one. We may have similarities. We may agree on some things. But none of us are going to think exactly like the other one. Um, 100% G-Hall with each other all the time. But we can't let that stop us. Now, I don't say totally be rude to the other person. That doesn't say you're right all the time. It says don't let it stop you from doing God's work. We must not let petty disagreements keep us from doing what God wants us to do. We've seen it. We've seen a Christian withdraw from the work over a dispute, over an argument, over a dirty look of another member. Barnabas and Paul agreed to disagree. Although they did not travel together during their next trip, they never stopped their work. They never stopped. Look how much they accomplished. The gospel was spread. Would it have reached as many people if Barnabas would have stopped? Oh, Paul may be mad. He hurt my feelings. I'm just done with the church. I'm not going to go talk to me. I don't care if anybody's saved. I don't care. I'm done. No. He continued. He understood there was going to be disagreements, and he continued. Now, was it easy to go on? I'm sure he missed Paul. He spent a lot of time with them. Um, he probably lost a pretty good friend, but it didn't let him stop him. The fourth thing, even, even good people slip sometimes. Barnabas was a good man, but he was influenced to do wrong by those around him. We are always tempted. We're all sinners who may say or think or do things contrary to God's, God's will. Although Barnabas followed Peter, God still loved him, still used him. God always loves us when we take a step in the wrong direction. We are not immune to sin. Just because we sin doesn't mean God has forsaken us. God's going to leave us. Now, we have to come back. We have to acknowledge that sin. We've got to quit doing that sin. But God never leaves us. We leave God. And I've heard that, you know, and I never understood it. I'm understanding it more the I get older, but... God never leaves us. We leave God. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means I'm the one going farther and farther and farther away. He doesn't move. He's constant. He's there. I'm the one that's either growing closer or going farther or staying where I'm at. I'm not doing either one. We, just like Barnabas, we're not exempt from sin. Um, sin just doesn't look ugly to us. Some sin looks really, really good to us. We're not exempt from that. But God can still use us. Lastly, what we can learn from Barnabas is we can and we should encourage others in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. We've always heard, I've always heard um, the American Standard Version encourage one another and build up one another. Don't tear down. Build up. Um, encouragement is a blessing. It's a blessing when we're going through difficult times with family problems, illness, grief, death, being faithful. The encouragement of our brothers and sisters often gives us the strength we need to make it through the dark times. God wants us to be that source of strength for others, to lend a helping hand or a listening ear encourage others who are facing trials to continue in their walk with the Lord. Be Barnabas. Be that one everybody wants to be around. Be that personality. Be that person. Barnabas was a good man who boldly taught the gospel and encouraged others to stay faithful. We should strive to all be Barnabases. Um, that is what I have for Barnabas. Uh, again, just encourage. If I had to sum him up in one word, encourage. Next week, Ananias keeping up appearances. I hope everyone has a great week and I will see you all next week. Thank you for listening.